I'm still in the Yerushalayim pet space.
חיים, ברוך אתו על עינו אלוהים המלך העולם, שהכל נהיה בגברו. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for coming, for joining us here, and to the Chevra online, thank you so much for being with us as well. I hope the camera is working this week. Um, all right, so I mean, uh, Yofi, it looks like it is. Okay, I'm so glad. All right, like we mentioned last week, um, like we mentioned last week, something very important, but before that, I'm sorry, I want to dedicate tonight's learning, the Ilui Nishmas, Nachum Shimon ben Yitzchak Arye. And that's our dear friend Toby's Abba, who left the world um, about six days ago. Toby and Chaya, they, they come and sit with, they learn with us quite often. They live right around the corner, dear, dear friends. Uh, this should be Mamash Leilui Nishmato Nachum Shimon Ben Yitzchak Arye. And for the Rafu Shlema of you. Yehudit Rivka Bat Begi. So, um, I've never been more excited to learn Parsha, to learn Sefer Bamidbar, to learn Parsha Bamidbar, to learn this fourth book of the Torah. Uh, every year, the Parshio just really, really have a life of their own. They get deeper and deeper and deeper. But every year, when it comes to right before Shavuot, we learn almost every single year, this parsha that we're learning right now, Bamidbar, comes right before Shavuot, almost always. And obviously, in Israel, the week, the week that comes right before Shavuot takes on a completely different meaning with Yom Yerushalayim. As much as Yom Yerushalayim is a fun thing to do in Chutz it's, it's not you don't really feel Yom Yerushalayim until... Actually, even until you're Yerushalayim, you can't be in Pedach Tikva, you have to be in Yerushalayim. Not that there's anything wrong being Pedach Tikva, but you have to be, you really have to be there. So I, you know, I'm still very much flying. On the one hand, I'll, I'll explain in a second, hopefully this will come out clear. On the one hand, I'm still flying from yesterday. Flying because I can't explain, I can't express in words what it means to be with so many people, so many Jews together, in a place where so many Jews used to get together forever. It's like the one place. Imagine if you know that this place that you were going on a date with someone that you love, that this same exact place was a date place where so many couples fell, you know, fell in love, or so many couples had their first experience of feeling something towards one another for thousands of years. And then you go back to the same place. So I feel that when we go back, when we're in Yerushalayim, it's like, it's, it's so amazing because we're on the date, but what's so heartbreaking is that we're not really in the same place where everyone fell in love with each other. We're outside the restaurant and we're not even banging on the door to them to let us in. We've been okay by settling for a table in the garden, but we want a table by the kitchen. <laughs> so that's why it's very bizarre to see so much simcha, so much happiness, by being given tables on this holy date, but not really being served directly from the cook, from the chef. We're kind of like, we're outside. And obviously what I mean is that we're definitely celebrating on the wrong side of the wall. It's very, very bizarre. It's, it's really the most weird, it's, it's Olam Hazel. Like last night to me is like, this is exactly Olam Hazel, this world, where you get so close, but it's still, until Mashiach comes, until the great day comes, it's still not really, it's not really that, but it's pretty, pretty close. <laughs> We're pretty close to it. But that wasn't the only reason why yesterday was so bizarre. Like, I, like many of you know, and many, I think some of you were there, yeah? Were you there? You were there yesterday. So for many years now, I can't, it's probably like 12 years already, I have the privilege of singing with one of the sweetest singers in Israel, one of the most special people in the world, my dear friend Chaim David by the Kotel on this Yom Yerushalayim night, and there's literally, it's the, it's the biggest thing I've ever been privileged to do, it's um, easy, 85, 90,000 people, I'm just right there, it's crazy. But that's not what's so amazing, it's, it's mean, the fact that it is, yeah, it's right there, but you're right next to the Kotel, you're right next to Harabait is what's amazing. And what's heartbreaking is, is that they make us come so early to do sound check and sit in, no, that's not, that, that's a little bit heartbreaking, but that's not the really heartbreaking part of it. We get there very early to avoid traffic, to avoid the jams, but then we have to sit there for a long, long time. And last night there were all these politicians that made sure they came exactly when the 80, 90,000 peaked. Then they got up 
and had to speak. And certain Rabbanim got up and spoke right then when the peak was there. And that was probably what was more heartbreaking than anything. And I hope they all mochel me. They all forgive me. Because we sat there and they had nothing to say. Nothing to say. You know, if you're with 90,000 people, what, what are you, if there's a chance to connect to 90,000 people, what, do you, what would you do? What would you say? I probably wouldn't say anything. Well, that, that's for sure. You know, I would dive in. It's like the, 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 the chief rabbi of the Kotel, I will say this to his chot, he said, it's a time for Kabbalat Om HaChut Shamayim, well, let's say I'll say Shema Yisrael together. That was high. But the rest, was there was, there was nothing there. So you feel like, wow, there's an opportunity for so many people to be together. Yom Yerushalayim, a few nights before Shavuot, the holy city, how much are we opening our hearts in, in prayer, in longing for something much deeper? Instead of proclamations, like Yerushalayim won't be divided. I don't even know what that means anymore. That, that, that statement is just very bizarre anyway. Um, we're so divided amongst ourselves, as if it matters if it's divided. Mm -hmm. like, anyway, it was just a night of a potential. That's what I felt, like a huge, huge, huge potential. This whole Yom Yerushalayim. But anyway, it should be a schut that I'll be able to tell my children one day, hey, you see, look, look over there. And we'll look from Harabait over to... You see, remember, you see there, yeah, what was there? Like, you know, right there, like, where there's just nothing? Like, uh, yeah, there's a little kolel there, there's a nice little breast of a kolel, the kota. Yeah, that's where we used to hang out, and everyone was, why were you guys so happy being outside over there? Like, ah. <laughs> that's the question I was waiting for so many years, so you'd ask me that question. You know, why were you guys so happy He's dancing over there? Anyway, that's what I had in mind when I was there last night. So, we're going to go right to it because this, this Shabbos of Bamidbar and the, this amazing, amazing Sefer, like I said, almost always happens that we learn Parshat Bamidbar the Shabbat before Shavuot. Now, last year, in the shir that we had here, I was so tempted to learn this piece with you, but there was another piece which Mamish got my heart, and we learned it last year, and I'll send it out again this year which was a brilliant piece from the B'tzalak HaKoyen of Lublin explaining what the Yom HaMiyuchas was, what there was a day mm -hmm. that comes. Do you remember this piece? I think it's on Gimel Sivan, this beautiful day where Am Yisrael were told as we're preparing to receive the Torah, bring your Sefer Yochsin, bring your book of lineage. It's called the Day of Lineage, and it was a very important teaching, which I'll be sending out as well. But I really wanted to learn this piece, and we began learning this piece last year in Yerushalayim, but really didn't finish it, didn't get to the meat of it. And before we go into tonight's text, just to, just to explain where we're at right now. Because we are learning Parshat Bamidbar, and all the commentators try to connect the fact of Mount Sinai to Matan Torah, meaning the fact is we can't, the, the fact of a, the whole concept of a desert is a prerequisite to understanding what a Torah is. All the Mepharshim speak about this. Why did it have to be in a desert? Why did the giving of the Torah have to be in the desert? And here we are, the Shabbos before Shavuot, and it talks about the Midbar, the desert. Well, what else happened in the desert, which was the beginning of something very strong? I saw Rebbe Leibola Eger just speak about it. What else happened in the desert, which was like the headquarters for something tremendous? It was Moshe Rabbeinu's revelation. Moshe Rabbeinu becoming the leader of Am Yisrael happens to him in the desert. He was the shepherding the flock in the desert. He was the receiving of the, of, of the burning bush. But the whole thing, by Moshe Rabbeinu, this whole thing was in the desert. So I was thinking about it, it could be that the whole giving of the Torah in the desert is just like paying tribute to Moshe Rabbeinu, maybe, on a certain level, you know, on a really far-out level. It's like the whole thing was that it had to be here because, Moses, you are so completely desolate of, of, of ego, like the desert. It had to be like this just to give it to you, you know, Mamish, just to give it to you. We're doing a whole Matan Torah just in your honor. But I want to say a few more things before we go inside the text, and it's not such a long text, but it's very important. It's very important to do this. Very, very important to do this. We right now are in Rosh Chodesh Sivan, which begins right now. 
Like we said, there's a few Sivan babies in the room already right now. When there was just four of us in the room, 75% of us were Sivan babies. Anyone else born in Sivan? My sister loves that baby girl. Mazel tov. That one reminds me. I said it before we were on camera. My sister just had a baby boy on Shabbos. It's a big simcha. So this is this is this is mamish in the schus of all the children that are keeping us alive. I want you all to play, pay really close attention to where we're at right now, as we're approaching Shavuot, and it really is in connection to Parashat Bamidbar. Reb Shlomo says a teaching from the Ishbet like this. On the first day, Rosh Chodesh Sivan, Torah Mamish says it, by Yom Hazeh, Ba'u Midbar Sinai. We came to the mountain by Yom Hazeh, on this day. And Chazal, our sages, teach us the importance of understanding what, why we have to know that it happened on Rosh Chodesh Sivan and what took place during Rosh Chodesh Sivan. The first three days of the month of Sivan play a crucial role in understanding what will take place by the end of the week, which is receiving the Torah. So listen to this, this is awesome. On the first day, we're gonna go just the three days and then go deep inside the text. On the first day when we got to Har Sinai, the Ribbon HaShlelem told us nothing. There was no talk. No one said anything. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. On the first day of Sivan, the Ribbon HaShlelem didn't say anything. There was absolute quiet. On the second day of Sivan, God tells us something. What does He tell us? You shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what we were told on Bet Sivan. And on Gimel Sivan, what were we told? The mitzvah of, the, the commandment of Hagbalah. Shloshet Yimei Hagbalah. The God says, okay, now you're not going to go forward anymore. Now, until here, you don't go to the mountain, and you don't do other things. You refrain. These were the first three days of Sivan. Again, the first day of Sivan, silence. God doesn't say anything to us. And Chazal tell us, I think it was a machmas chulsha de orcha, because of their, they were so tired. Because, by the way, how long were they walking around for already? Approximately. How long had they been just walking around, day after day? 40. About 40 44 days, let's say 45 days, right? So they're walking and schlepping. Chazal say, Machmas Achulsha de Orcha, because they, they, were, they, were, they were just weak. They were so tired. God says, You know what? Just schluff a little bit. I'm not going to burden you. Just encamp here. Make sure you're here. It's fine. Then the second day, God says to them, Okay, now that you rested, you got a little bit of quiet. Now I want to tell you, I want you to be for me a kingdom of priests. Big stuff. And on the third, which means, Reb Shlomo says, name the Ishbitzer, you all have potential to mamash be like infinite. Kingdom of priests, you know, a Kohen, he's working in the Holy of Holies. He's working in the holiest place in the world. He's involved with such Kedusha. He's involved with such holiness. Amazing, out there, infinite, it's eternal. There's so many things to do. Then God says to them, okay, on the third day, Hakbala, which means Mugbal. Now you're limited. So what did we have on the second day and the third day? the Torah of infinity, and on the third day, the Torah of... Yeah, Ariel, I think you taught me this word. Was it you? Finitude? Did you teach me that many years ago? Could be? I don't think so. No, it doesn't sound like... I feel like the group... Yeah, we made it up. Did we make it up? Oh, oh, okay, okay. For some reason, I thought of you, yeah. Finitude. Finitude? Finitude? Not infinite, okay? Finiteness, that's what Ibn Shlomo called it. And this is an amazing and important, important lesson that the Rebona Shleilam is teaching us before we receive the Torah. On the first day, just be quiet, relax, come, welcome, take off your shoes. It's not really exactly what it's about. We're not going to get into, real, maybe, maybe next year we'll talk about why God didn't tell us the first, anything the first day we got on Rosh Chodesh Sivan. But the second day is, If you're really one with what I'm about to give you, you could be the, not just like the Mufcharim, the chosen ones will be priests. All of you, I'm a kingdom of priests. And this is obviously the week of Malchut. 
this last week of Sviyata Omer is always the week of Malchut, the week of becoming a king. And this, it's, very sh- it's shining into us very deeply, the, p- the potential opportunity that each and every one of us can come, can mamish become a priestly king, reach the stars. But then God says, okay, but now you have to know there's limits in life as well. And this is a place where each of us are trapped in as a Yiddish and Hashem. We have something that we're made out of that makes us think that we can do anything in the world. When we're tapped into certain specific things, really, let's just call it spade for spade. When we're in the Torah, not just as spectators, but when we're living, breathing Torah. When Torah is not a subject or a shear that I go to, and that's my connection to it, but it's that which leads my life I'm not finite, I'm infinite, I can do anything. I want to be able to do anything in the world. And that's amazing. However, where do I live? I live in a world where it's after the sin of the tree of knowledge. I'm in a world, I'm in a body of zmani, of everything's temporary, of finite. I want to teach my children the secrets of the world. But I first have to teach them Aleph Bet. I want to experience such infinite love with my spouse. But I have to know what it means to give them a cup of coffee or for the health freaks and, you know, just a cup of water, right? <laughs> if I'm exhausted and they're exhausted, I, it's finite. I have to go back into a finite world of, doesn't matter if I'm feeling, you know, I could be like, oh, sweetie, I'm so, it's so, I just feel so infinite. Don't you feel like I'm bringing you a cup of water? Isn't it, isn't it so infinite, right? <laughs> This is so infinite, like, it's amazing, you know. You know what? We don't even have to respect each other the way the world respects each other. That's so, like, finite. That's so old school. Let's just, you know, know in our hearts we respect each other to the heart. It doesn't work like that, right? We know that. It doesn't work. And it's like this with everything in life. And the dichotomy, that clash between the two, is really what, what makes it very, very hard for us to feel that we have a way in this world because there is a very strong part of me that's infinite. My neshama is infinite. And yet my goof, which I'm supposed to sanctify, keeps on bringing me down, down to this world. It's mamish, Bet Sivan versus Gimel Sivan. It's these two days against each other. And yet this is a preparation for receiving the Torah. So having said all that, we're going to look into tonight's text. The beginning of it I learned with some of you last year in Yerushalayim, but we took it to another place, and it was very important for me that we try to do this again. And this time a little bit differently. And it's not too long, but I think we could, uh, we could do it with a lot, of, a lot of beauty. It's good. I mean, I already benched spirits, so I could say this is really like in the schut of the sphere of tonight, which is Tif Eret Sheba Malchus, the beauty of becoming a king, the beauty of governing, and also, you know, I, I heard today, uh, I heard a Givav Vort, name of the Maharsha, he says that Rosh Chodesh is the Gematria, Rosh Chodesh is the Gematria David Melech Yisrael Chai Vekayim. It's pretty far out, no? Mm-hmm. David Melech, which David Melech is the master of Rosh Chodesh, obviously. And he's also, this is Dafka, his month, his week, Shavuos, which is your site, and according to our tradition, it's also his birthday. So, anyway, the gates are open for hopefully instilling within us very strong learning right now, right now, and hopefully holding on to it as we go into Shavuot. So Rabbi Shlomo says like this, the Haftarah of Bamidbar, now he's going to the Haftarah, he's, which is very rare that he does this. There's only one other parsha that he usually really teaches a lot out, out of the Haftarah, which is obviously Shabbos Nachamu Bait Chanan, Nachamu Nachamu Ami. But it's very rare that he's really big on the Haftarah over here. Look at this. The Haftarah of Bamidbar begins. Vehayam ispar b'nei Yisrael kechol hayam asher lo yimod velo yisaper. What does that mean? And the number of Israel will be numberless, right? I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to translate it word for word. And behold, the number of Am Yisrael will be like the sand of the, by the ocean, by the sea, 
which cannot be measured and cannot be counted. The number is not a number. The number is numberless. And then it says, "Behaya bimkom asher yeamer lahem lo ami atem yeamer lahem bni kel chay." And at the very place where people will tell you that you are not God's people, God will tell you, "You are children of the living God." So Ibn Shlomo says, "So even if I wouldn't say anything, it's already mind blowing these words, right?" just on its own, with strong words from the Aftaran, you know. Our number is that we have no number, meaning our, the amount, you know, of the... By the way, why, why is it talking about this in Because obviously we do another counting, as another census of counting Am Yisrael in the beginning of this Sefer, in the beginning of this, during the, this Parsha, Parsha Bamidbar. So obviously the Aftaran is going to talk about it in a certain way. But here the Aftaran says you can keep on counting each other and get to certain numbers, whatever it is. But the truth is, you don't have a number. You have nothing to do with, with, with finite, you know, numbers are, like Rabbi Shlomo was once asked in 1979, how many songs do you have until now? And he said, you know, I'm very nervous to, to put a number onto that because anything that has a number is finite. And I don't want to ever make anything about my music finite, right? I, it's, you don't put numbers on, on those things. That's also the reason why we don't say, you know, numbers of children, the chule. It's not just because, that's, and by the way, that's a very... You know, non Yiddish thing to do, you know that, right? But <laughs> and anyway, it's something much, much deeper than that. We don't put, when we put a number on things, it's like you're putting a, t- it's like you're putting a mechse, you're putting a, a tap, a cover, you're covering it. We're keeping it opened. Now look where Ibn says. What are we busy with in this world? On the one hand, we're living a very finite and limited life. When I don't sleep, I can't function the next morning. Someone came to the old Lubavitcher Rebbe and said, I would like to study all night, and then tomorrow I'll be a different person. So the Rebbe says, yes, you will be different. Everybody will be learning and you'll be sleeping. (laughs) So you have to sleep, you have to eat. You cannot be at two places at the same time. But on the other hand, I have such an urge to be infinite. I'd like to be in 15 places at the same time. And, and you know what? And when you start to get tuned into the world of Torah, you'd love to, you, you would love to be up three nights in a row. Like, that's not something that you don't want. You do have an urge. You do have a cheshek to be me'al azman, to be above time, or me'al makom, to be above time and space. And what happens to us when we realize, like, wait a second, I can't. So what does it say about me? Am I tuned into who I am, or am I not? Mm. You know, this is a very the tension there is very interesting. Some of us like have no problem with like with you know I don't know I never had an urge to be infinite I never had an urge to stay up every night I never had an urge to you know talk to thirteen people at the same time. In fact, talking to one person every thirteen days is fine for me, right? <laughs> what do you what, is, what what does this mean? Like here he's saying something. Nah, some of us want to connect so much to people that we'd love to be able to connect to many people directly at once. Mamish, like taking the finite me, just me, and making it very, very infinite, making it much bigger, endless. This is what this paragraph was. So, Reb Shlomo says, sometimes we love people so much and we wish they would be infinite. And this is very, very, very important, this paragraph. Then suddenly, we're on the third paragraph, then suddenly we find that they also have walls. They're also finite, right? You reach a certain place. Sometimes we're, here storing, we're hearing stories about Rebbe's, such holy tzaddikim, and then suddenly we come upon a story about them and get so disappointed. Not that they necessarily did anything bad, but we realize they're all, sorry about the table, we realize they're also finite. Givat, what a disappointment. He's also finite. What am I going to do now? Meaning, you know, for some reason we're able to be inspired the most by those people that who seem to us the most not like me, the most infinite, the most not needing any boundaries and being able to lifrotz kol gedeh, being able to, uh, how do you say that, to uh, break through any limitation, right? 
So, and, and what happens is we put people on such a pedestal, right? Now, that's generally, generally our fault. It's, it's, we always go, back. that's something that I have to work on. And then what happens to me? My worlds crash. When does my world crash? Not necessarily when I found out that this rub that I was into uh, committed a crime. It's not that. It's that maybe they were wrong with something that they once said. So then what happens to all the other infinite, infinite Torah they taught me? Ah, can't be, because there's a part of him that's finite. Like, I'll tell you an example. Someone, someone once wanted me to meet his Rebbe because he thought it'd be really good for us and, <clears throat> he, and, and that it could help me a lot, the Chulei. And this Rebbe is very big onto reading names. I was never so much into that, but I said, you know, I have to have a Munas Tzadikim and it's fine. So gave him my name and 95% of, of what he said based on my name was pretty accurate, right? But at the end, when we left, my friend said to me, wow, did you, did you, you, know, did you realize like, that, was, that was an amazing thing, right? So, and so I, I, said, I said to him, you know, I'll tell you the truth, even if he wasn't accurate with reading my name, or, right, but he had really good etzos on how to live life, I would listen to the etzos, right? Meaning, like, it's important to know that people have a connection to the beyond the infinite, but if it doesn't add up for you, let it not crash and blind everything else that's good that they can give you. But it happens to us a lot when it comes to love, when we love someone. And love is usually, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Lechatchila world, it's always connecting us to the infinite, to something that's so beyond. And yet sometimes, we, sometimes, usually we see that real love only comes through getting through finite moments together. You know, real love is only about not how do I stay infinite with you, it's how do I stay close to you when we're finite. That's the real love. That's the real love. But really what it is, is how do I bring moments of infinity into finite moments? And I, I kind of gave away the rest of the shi right now, but I don't care. It's important to say that right now. How do I, in the Mina Meitzar, while I'm going through such you know, difficult times, how do I bring the infinity into that? I don't need to master being finite too. We're pretty much like that. I need to figure out a way how to go, how to get through those finite moments with that part of me that really wants to be beyond this world. And not the other way around. You know, sometimes what happens to us, we're, inf we're feeling infinite, we feel like we can do anything, and before we ask God for anything, we say, uh-uh, 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 remember, you're just a human being, and human beings don't ask too many things from other human beings, you know, like, you know, the way, you know the difference between asking Hashem for something and asking someone else for something? You know, imagine you call up a, a someone, none of us should ever need it, but if you need a loan, you have a distant cousin or a neighbor that has a lot of money, and you call them up and you ask them for, you know, 50 grand. And whatever it is, they say yes, they give it to you. It's pretty infinite, right? And then when you call them again, like a few months later, you say, you know, I'm so sorry, I just, you know, I need, I need 20 grand. They say, well, you, you, you just came up to me last month and had 50 grand, right? So that's why we don't ask that person, we just, hopefully we don't, you know, ask that person, we just ask for, ask him again right away. You know what happens to Kaddish Baruch Hu when you borrow 50 grand in the morning and by Mincha you ask for another $10,000? You know what God says? Shut, what took you so long? That's infinite. That's an infinite relationship. What I just said right now is one of the hardest things to truly believe in. It's one, because we relate on the level of asking, like when we do with other people, when we ask them for something, it's like a bad vibe of a favor that I know is hanging on my shoulder. And then it's slow naim already, then we, can't, we see each other on the street, it's not comfortable anymore. We get invited to the same Shabbos table, it just feels weird. Our wives, our friends, then they find out that we did this, and then the whole thing is weird, you know? So, with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, though, it's exactly the opposite. When you come back to the Rebona Shleilam and say, I, I need another 20, I, I, please, I need another 20 again, it really is a level of what took you so long. An infinite relationship has no limitations on what you could ask from each other. Not just on what you can ask from each other, but how you feel afterwards. 
the feelings that come after, it has, they have no ramification, nothing. On the contrary, can you imagine a friend? Can you imagine a friend that you truly get nachas every time they come to you and ask you for something? I'm so happy that you're coming to me. And then you do the same thing in the afternoon. I'm so happy you're coming to me. That's an amazing thing. That's an infinite relationship. It's an amazing thing. Now, can you imagine every time your spouse asks you to do something and you remember how lucky you are that this person that you chose to spend the rest of your life with is the one that keeps on asking you for something? I'm so happy you asked me. And you didn't ask the other person you could have married? Like, if that was consciously what's going on in my mind all day long, every request would be like an infinite request. Now, I know we're speaking really high right now, really, really big. Don't worry, because I don't know anyone that acts like this, okay? Everyone, <laughs> calm down, everyone. It's a goal. It's nice. Don't kill yourselves if you don't feel it uh, in this lifetime, maybe in another lifetime, but hopefully you can get it done now. To feel infinite with another person is, means imagine how God feels when you ask Him for something. And it's a good, good opportunity right now, the week before Shavuot, to rid yourself of understanding God's, God's answering you like the way someone finite would answer you. Okay, let's look back inside. Now open your hearts, friends. This is a Torah from the Tiferes Yosef. The Helege Tiferes Yosef is the son of the Baal at Chavis of Radzin. Just to make that a little bit clearer, the Tiferet Yosef's name was Reb Mordechai Yosef Elazar. He was the great-grandson of the Mea Shiloh. And I believe that it's his brother or uncle whose yard site was today, Reb Shleimel Radziner. Reb Shleimel Radziner was killed by the Germans, Yimach Shemal. May their name be blotted and erased forever, for etern eternity. And what this Reb Shleimel Radziner did was that he was in, I think, in Auschwitz, or maybe Treblinka, and he took, Mamish, he saw that, like, everyone's going to die right now. There's nothing here. And it's a whole story. He took off his boot, and he looked at the German. He said, you think you have any dominion over me because of that gun? And he showed in front of everyone. He took off his boot and whacked the German in the face. Wow. I mean, he was gunned down a second later, but that Nazi's burning in hell for eternity, and Reb Shleimler Radzin is alive for forever. Anyway, it's a big Gvura day, like a very, very, very strong day. Anyway, this is all from the same dynasty of, of, of uh, Ishbitzer of Zim. The Heliger Ishbitzer says that the most infinite place in the world is the desert. You can do what you want to, go where you want. In this world, when I go right, I'm going to Chicago. When I go left, I'm going to New York. By the way, where is he if he says that? Well, no, honestly, I'm, I always try to figure this out. Where is he located if he said, if he said that? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Ugh. Yeah. Pittsburgh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask. <laughs> Pittsburgh, wow, you're really good. In the desert, there's no north and no left. In this world, I go south, I'm going to Miami. Huh. I'm going, oh, he's giving us more hints. I'm going north, I'm going to Boston. Yeah. yeah. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> I just figured out where he was. West Orange. <laughs> no, he's at a Ruach retreat. Yeah, and they would do it. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm in the desert. It doesn't make a difference. You can go south, you can go north, you get nowhere. It's all infinite. It doesn't matter. There's no limits, right? Desert's a desert. It's just not that it's infinite that you have everything. But that the feeling of you just, there's no limits, is everywhere. You get nowhere. You can go south, you can go north, you get nowhere. So he says, the deepest depths. Do you know what we have to do? You and, and, this, you and I have to take this inf infiniteness and put it in the Torah. This is why the Torah was given to us in a desert. Now what does that mean? Well, how does that make sense? It's very hard. What does that mean? This is why the Torah was given to us. What does that have to do with anything? Let me ask you a question. God says, keep Shabbos, don't eat pork, wear it sits us, light candles, don't turn on lights, don't do this, do that. 
Does the Torah seem finite or infinite to you? Let's be mamish, the most finite, it's amazing. The Torah, uh, just like if the Torah was given in a shul, it would be the worst thing in the world, <laughs> right? Because the Torah is finite, These it's laws, right? And the shul, right? I can't even say it's finite. Finite's a high level for some shuls, right? I don't even know what's less than that. So here he's saying, the Torah, which seems to be like laws, like you do this, you do that, like it has a number. There's how many laws are there? How, how much did you weigh when you were born? 613, right? You like, yeah. you just, you just said it before she right now. That's what, that's what I'm saying. I'm, <laughs> I'm putting her on the spot. Every, these things have numbers. The Torah has numbers. You know, and look, sometimes we look at people that are so into keeping Torah, and the smell that we get from them is what? God, you're so finite. You, you walk around thinking all day long about what you can do or can't do. Why would I ever want to be part of that? I want to fly. I want to soar. And unfortunately, so many people that teach Torah don't even attempt to bring infinity into the finiteness of the way the laws were given to us. And therefore, the taste you get from it is, I don't want to be part of it. Why would I? Why on earth would a human being want to be part of something like this, which just limits boundaries, numbers, finite? So here he's saying, no, the Torah is given. Where is the Torah given? In a place that's just open and you can open to you. It's your thing. It's totally open. There's no directions. There's no miles. No one's counting anything. It's all open. Why? Take that energy and understand that that realm of openness and infiniteness is within every single finite commandment. Put it like this. Do you know how much freedom I get from the laws of Shabbos? Do you know how infinite I become when there's so-called restrictions on what I'm allowed to do and what I can't do in the world? Let's go. Let's go a little bit more easier for us. You get married. Is marriage infinite or finite? It depends on you, huh? Well, it depends on how sarcastic and cynical you become in the first few years of your marriage to answer that question. But let's be real. Is marriage finite? The act of marriage, is it finite? It's one of the most finite things in the world, right? But the potential of becoming one with one person in the world is the most infinite thing in the world. But there's no way to taste that infinity unless it's done through a finite act. There's no way. There's no way for you to taste what God has in store for you unless you take the infinity of the desert and you put it into the finite... What did we say again? Finitude. Finitude. Finite of each of each law. You know, the tzaddikim, they could tell you, they could tell you about how free and how large and how, how just like infinite you could become from the smallest things in the world which seem like they're usher to you, right? It's, this is like the healthiest religious Torah I've ever heard in my life. But it obviously needs a lot more work to grind this if we could get, give over to ourselves and to a whole generation how by keeping the halachas that we're taught is actually the only way for us to truly find the most I infinite ways of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Oh, we'd be so amazed. I love, we, how could we not try to like, master that in order to give, up, give, it, give it, get it over to our children? Our children are going to ask much deeper questions than we're prepared for. Be clear about that. However much you think you're prepared, your children are always going to ask you much deeper questions than that. You have to cry over this day and night. And that's what we're getting to right now. How? How do I see the infinity and the finitude? How could I do it? How could I really feel that by keeping all these laws and by connecting myself to commandments which seem so brutally finite, how is it possible to feel like I got the whole world in my hands? Are you kidding me? I have barely an Eruv in my hands. Like, I don't have anything to work with. I'm so limited every, on time, space, everything. Look what he says. Bottom paragraph. But you see what it is. It's even more than that. 
The deepest depths of life is to know that even when you find yourself in the desert, even there God can show you a way. God can lead you out of the desert to the Holy Land. But just remember, it might take 40 years, and it will probably take 40,000 mistakes on the way. But it boils down to this. When you're in the desert, how much do you cry for someone to give you a map? Now, I want to explain this. When you're in the desert, meaning when you're feeling infinite, when you're feeling that you can do anything in the world, but you can't relate it to people, how much are you crying to God for Him to give you a way to express that feeling of being infinite in Olam Hazen, in this world? Musicians, I've seen them go crazy because their infinity of their... You guys, you live right across from the studio, right? That's where I met you? Sometimes we're sitting in the studio and we're going through a track and I'm realizing, oh my God. But it can go here, but we can take this, we could, you know, you could lose your, you can manage to lose your mind. So the whole thing seems like a desert, not that it's desolate, but that you could go anywhere. There's no limitations. There's, it's, you know, mamish, an eternal amount of opportunities, what to do with it. So Reb Shlomo says, when you're in that place, how important it, it, is it for you to find an expression in this world? Can someone give you a map and tell you, I'm going to take you to a place where you can actually uh, actualize all this potential? Now, what is that place called in this world? What is that place of actualizing the potential of infinity in finite vessels? What is that place called in this world? Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Remember, we're embarking on a journey over here. In we're in Bamidbar in the desert, and we're 40 years, but where are we headed to the whole time that we're learning how to take infinity of mana falling down from heaven and sing it in my own life, of crossing the Red Sea and then knowing how to be a mensch to someone else the next day? Where are we on our way? We're on our way to Yerushalayim. We're on our way to Jerusalem because Yerushalayim is the headquarters of making peace between infinite and finite. In Yerushalayim, like for instance, in the whole, I know we're speaking really big tonight, but it's okay sometimes to really stretch our minds and our hearts and our souls. In the base of Mikdash, what was the most infinite thing that was, what was the most finite thing that was also infinite? What does it say about something in the base of Mikdash? Ha'aron. The measurements of the ark, if you actually add up the measurements, it doesn't work out to the space that it was given. It was the Aaron which carried the Lucho Tabri, the, 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 which carried the Namish, the, 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 the Torah. The Aaron itself was a thing that had finite limits, right? Measurements, but really it was beyond measurements. It, it wasn't even space for it. it was, if you add up the measurements, it does not add up. Why? Because only in the Holy of Holies does there, is there oneness between infinite and finite. Mamish infinite and finite. Now let's go further. And this is the deepest death, friends. Bottom over here. There are certain things, I know it's a little bit hot, I'm sorry, air conditioning is not working that well, but we have to really go through this. There are certain things that I dive in for and God answers me. There are certain things in my life that unless I cry like I'm in the desert, it's the only way to daven. There is no other way. Because for God to answer this prayer, this prayer has to come from the deepest, deepest depths. You know what's amazing? You know, when we pray to Hashem, what, what's usually like the magnitude of our prayer? Like, what is it really about? It's usually about, oh, I should have parnas, I should, you know, things, things should be good, everything should be okay. When was the last time you ever begged, cried before God, or asked Hashem, asked God, can my soul please have an expression in this world? Can I please express myself in this world? Can you find a way for all those things which only you and I speak about? For that, can I have one friend in the world that I could tell them all these things that to everyone else they might seem completely, completely nuts? You ever daven for that one friend? 
for that one person. All you need is one person. That before them, there's absolutely no shame. You can sound like the most infinite, infinite being in the world. But it's just until I'm able to find that person, I could go nuts. Just like, what's his name? Who cut off his ear? Van Gogh. Yeah. And, and, and all the stories about Mozart and Beethoven, there's, there's, there's mamish, endless amount of stories about these geonim, about these geniuses that were big neshamas, big neshamas, and almost felt tortured. Like, how can you give me such a big neshama in such a finite world? Ah, the Torah. Asher b'charbanu mikol amim. Yonatan lanu et Torah to the Torah is the tools to take the infinity and put it into finite kelim, which lead me to Yerushalayim. But Rabbi Shlomo says, you know, you can't just ask Hashem, please give me a tool to express my infinity. You, you, you have to cry. You can't say, Hashem, you know, it'd be nice if I had someone that I could express to them my dreams. That's not how you ask for something like this. How much are you crying for a map in the desert? When you feel like you have the whole world, you feel so free, and yet you feel so lost because you don't see anything. How much are you crying over that? Now, let's make it on a very simple level. level. I go up to Baron Rothschild. He's back to Baron Rothschild again. Give me a thousand dollars. Doesn't have to be such a gewalt reason. If I go up to him and ask him for a hundred million dollars, it better be something important. When I ask God to make a way in my desert, meaning that I could find a way to get out of there and express myself in a, in a good way, it better be something important. It better be something deep. So therefore, the Aftara says, "Bemakom asher yomar lahem lo ami atem." It's not that someone else tells me that I'm not really God's child. It's when I tell myself, "Just face it, I'll never find a way out of here." The Prophet says, "Yomar elokechem bni kel chai." We're gonna now look what he does with this. I want you to know something so deep. If I would like to know how much my children know that I'm their father, they ask me for orange juice, they can ask the maid. That's not how, that's not how I could see how much we're really close. They ask me for $10, they can ask that from anybody. Now look what it is. When they ask me for something impossible and they know their father will do it for me, they'll find a way. Our connection hits me so strong. Look what he's saying over here. Something very interesting. You know, children ask for us all the time for different things, right? But it doesn't turn me on so much when my child asks me for something that anyone else can do. In fact, it's, it seems like another bakasha. Oh, okay, you want this? You just asked me for that. You want this? You want this? Say there. Abba, turn on the light. Abba, do this. Mama, Ima, I need help with... Things that anyone else can do when our children ask us for them, they don't necessarily brighten our connection very deep. But when my child asks me for something that seems impossible, and yet I see they're coming for me, they're asking it for me, boom, then the light gets turned on. Something changes. Something happens. I see they're coming to me with their requests for, let's just call it, infinity. They, they think that I could do that for them? something gets turned on in me. Now, you're trying to think, like, what would my child ask, you know? Well, we'll see. Those of us that have little children, maybe maybe not yet, but when the children get older, I'm sure, like, hopefully they'll ask their parents for things that you'd never think you could provide for them. And yet what? The fact that they ask you for it humbles you and honors you so much and instills within you the belief that you can do anything in the world from them at that moment, the connection between parents and children becomes infinite, more infinite than anything. You know, when they're little and you say, I'll do anything for you, how could you quetch if they wake you up five times a night? Didn't you just say, I'll do anything for you? Why would you tell them, no, you got to go back to sleep? And you keep on telling me all day long, Abba, I'll do anything in the world for you. And, and you do, you mean it. But all the bakashot, all the requests are finite bakashot. They're finite requests. Until they ask you for an infinite request, 
which then also breaks open your, your finite capability. That's what children, children bring, you know, if, if as long as your child asks you for things and you don't have to work hard on yourself to provide it for them, it's a very olam relationship. It's a very finite relationship. The second your child asks you for things that you can't imagine you could be able to do, whether it's to stay up with them all night, whatever it is, that at that moment, when something seems impossible and they ask you for it, that's when you mamish become their parent. For real. For real, for real. Parents are not here to provide finitude for their children. That too. Parents are here to attend for the infinity the child will bring out of their parents. So therefore, Reb ends off by saying like this. Do you know when God is letting us know that we are the children of the living God? When we ask Him for a way in the desert, meaning when we're in that place that's completely desolate, that seems like there's no way, A, out of here, or B, to express on myself. At that moment, Hashem lets you know, oh, you finally understand that I'm not a soda machine that you put in a, you know, whatever it is, 75 cents or a buck 20, or I see now different airports, like 225 for a can of soda, <laughs> which is how we usually think our relationship is with God. I ask for something, if I have enough to put in, He'll give it to me. God is waiting for us to always ask Him for so much more than we think we are allowed to ask Him for. And that's the difference between the way we relate to the the way we, we hopefully will relate to God when it comes to ask davening and for other people. Because we come from a people, Asher lo yimad ve lo yisaper. If, there's, if I come from a numberless number, if I come from an infinite people, if there's something about me that knows no boundaries, my first lesson in becoming infinite is checking myself and seeing what do you ask from Hashem? That's it. You want a good question to guide you preparing for the Torah this week? Ask yourself every day, how far do I go with God? Like really, how far do I go with God? How, what kind of godly relationship do I have in my life? How much of Hashem do I have in any of my relationships? Or are all my relationships just all of them finite relationships? And obviously, we take this with spousal relationships, parents and children. How much of all, and, and let's say a person doesn't want to start asking these questions. Why? Because everything's good, everything's fine, everything's safe. I don't have any problems with people. My wife and I don't fight. My children, very well mannered. We, we know when it's time out time and when everything else, everything works, everything's misudar. I don't want to start scratching the surface and realizing that most of my relationships in life are so finite. And most friends that I have, I could never ask them for an infinite request. I could never ask them for them to give me a map in my desert. Why would I want to do that? Everything's working. So you want to spend the rest of your life in such a shallow, Dalit Amos world of laws that don't have any depth? For some people, they will not go deeper with their Talmud Torah why? Because the way that they mapped it out, it's fine. Don't, if something's not broken, don't fix it. Ah, your thing isn't even broken. It's non-existent. It's not that it's broken. It doesn't, it's not even there. What are you talking about? How many marriages are, don't even exist? The fact that they're not divorced is, is the greatest that's left in the, that's not what, that's not people get, people don't get married in order so that they don't get divorced. Will get married to become infinite. But that's the same thing with the Torah. I can't marry the Torah just so that we don't fight. I marry the Torah, I receive the Torah and Shmuel so I can become infinite in this world. And it's the look, you're not gonna walk away with answers tonight, I'll tell you that much. Okay, there's no tonight, there's no answers. Usually there isn't, but tonight definitely not. <laughs> because this concept, is, this is your own private body. This is not for to, to go to a shir, and this is not also to give this over at a Shabbos table, obviously. This yantiv, you have Shabbos, and Shavuos, you get a bunch of meals. 
I'll send out cute vorts, cash tours if you want, but that's, that's, that's not what it's about because honestly, we, we want a lives not just full of meaning. We want to go beyond our potentials. We want everything that we're already involved with to really go beyond leaps to everything. You know, if we really x-rayed every single shul that exists on Shavuos, and we, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to continue the sentences, it's too painful. But last night was Yom Yerushalayim and there were 80,000, 900 people dancing by the Kotel. Do you know how finite it was? How could it be infinite if people weren't looking to the other side and not crying, saying, what the heck are we doing over here? For how much longer are we just going to be happy with the kima, kima, with the little by little by little? At a certain point, God's looking down and saying, wait a second, it's not bothering you that you've been waiting to get a table inside and no one's even coming to tell you it'll be another five minutes, you just accepted it, this is the way it is? Such a potential for infinity and we're okay with finite? That's painful. Sorry? I mean, mine is fine. Like, I guess I'm old and I remember, like, not being able to go anywhere near the hotel, climbing up to the roof of the Yemka, and the boys in the group, like, rice tree a million miles away. And, like, I go there every time. Like, like, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Like, when you, 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 how many years we could I go wish. anywhere near it? I wish. I wish. I wish. You have to be careful with ingratitude. You have to be careful. Like, yes, you know, it's like if your husband brings you a cup of coffee, maybe too hot or too much milk, thank you so much for a cup of coffee. And if he brings you, like, you tell him, my, my, my shiny, my neighbor, he always brings such beautiful flowers to his wife. He brings you a handful of you know, junk from the Long Island Railroad. <laughs> And you say, wow, it's really pretty, thank you. You put it in a vase and you make it nice, you make yeah. it fuss, you'll get roses. <laughs> but if you do, I, I, I worry about that. I was like, get him set to do a vase. Good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Ah, <laughs> so you see? Yeah. You keep crazy. We keep crazy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Say thank you is the last one. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, 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 that's finite. That's finite yeah, is yeah. saying thank you. Right. Absolutely. And infinite is? Thank you for what we have. So we don't want more. We say thank you and then, okay. Oh, we like it so much. Well, Master, Shlomo has a whole Torah on that. Shlomo, it's so good. As he's saying, it's such an amazing thing. Shlomo says, you know, it's amazing. God gives you a little bagel and you say, thank you. No, no, a bagel, because you wash. You say, no, 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 no. You wash. You say, you give a little bagel. And, you, and while you're saying, thank you for the bagel, you say, you know what? While you're at it, can you also like fix the whole world and build the basic make sure? How did why why it's a whole it's a long Torah we never learned it it's an amazing teaching. He says that the secret of a yid when it comes to see with a human being you would never talk like that like someone invites you to their house, uh, like you know for a meal, so like you don't say that oh but thank you so much. You don't mind if I just take over you know if I move in here right? You don't say that. Well, I have friends that have done that. <laughs> that, that, that but you don't usually say that, but, 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 but with God, the point, the, the reason why he gave you something in the first place is that you feel close enough to ask him for anything afterwards. And that's really that chibur between finite and infinite. The Torah was given to us not so that we could say, thank you, I'll go and try to figure this out on my own. The Torah is dafka unclear because God wants you to keep on taking that and say, okay, but what does this mean? What is the, you know, teachers, we always, we always want to impress them after a shir. Okay, does, any, does everyone understand? And when you, you know, you, yeah. But really, what is God? God God's going to say, does anyone understand? And when, and when you say no, please explain it to me deeper. That's, that's the hana, that's the pleasure. That's the infiniteness. That's, that's what he's, kivyochel, so to speak, waiting for, you know? Like, honestly, a husband want, hopefully wants to, you know, if, 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 if he didn't get the coffee right, he doesn't want his wife to say, oh, no, it's okay. He wants to know how to make it infinitely good for her. <laughs> he wants to know. Obviously, alivai, alivai. But anyway, our relationship with the Torah, 
Our relationship with the Torah needs so much fixing. It's unbelievable. It's just so wacky. It's so crazy, and it's, it's even a little bit scary when I think about it for myself. But um, I can't get, I can, Hashem can do anything. Hashem can enlighten the whole world in a split second. Yiratzon, it should be a Kaddish Baruch Hu's will, and our will as well, that when we receive the Torah, uh, this coming Shavuot, that when it comes, when we, when, when we say it certain words, when there's certain moments, when we're standing there, we feel like it's ki echad belev echad. Just know that when Hashem is asking us, do you want this or not, when, do you want the Torah or not, you know, what we say is, we don't say yes because we understand how good it is for us. We say yes, I don't have any idea how good this is for me. Na'asev But remember, part of the whole relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, part of the whole thing, is that He's waiting for you to come back for another loan for another deeper understanding, for another gift, for another sefer. When he puts you by the table and he gives you a bagel, he's waiting for you to ask for everything in the world. I love if we could do that with one person in our life, one person in our life would be so special. <laughs> That's like, the, it's just as important as every other thing in life. It is so, like, it kind of connects to, like, the learning alone thingy. Like, uh, there's, there's, there's certain things you can only learn alone, but there are certain things you can only learn while expressing how alone you are to someone else in the world. If you don't, if you don't have the outlet to express it, you're limited with understanding yourself. And maybe that's why. Chazal say, O chevruta, O mituta, that if you don't have a chevrusa in this world, it's, oh, it's, like, it's like you're not really alive. So anyway, I think that getting close to Matan Torah is also a certain good avoda, is to not be too depressed. If you ask the question, do I have that one relationship in my life, and the answer is no, well, start off by crying to God like you're in a desert needing a map. Perfect time to cry out for that. It's not a luxury. It's not an option. It, it is mamish a must. It really, really is. I bless us all to have that Bifat Hashem. Mm-hmm. All right, so next week, I'll see you all next week. She is not going to be on Monday night. I have to find out when I, if I can do it later in the week because David Zeller is your site. Mm-hmm. So that's next Monday night. And 
I'll let you know after. I'll, I'll send out an email. I'll let you know exactly when. Anyway, it should be the most beautiful, sweetest, and real, and infinite, and finite shmulets you ever had. Yeah.